So let's discuss some of these uh, medical developments with emergency physician and ABC News contributor Dr. Darian Sutton. And, and Doctor, let's start with that vaccine for children between six months and five years old. So what are the findings of this data? What does this mean for parents? So this is exciting uh, preliminary data. It's not yet fully complete, and of course it's data by press release, so it's not optimal, but it's something. So we're gonna gleefully look at it and try to interpret it. What we've gotten from this is that the Pfizer trial has shown that their vaccine, the three-dose regimen, it was incredibly effective, up to 80% effective in preventing symptomatic cases of COVID-19 in children between the ages of six months and five years old. I will say, however, that that number might change in the near future as the study is still ongoing and cases are still go coming in. Um, and my hope is that after these FDA independent advisory meetings and the follow-up meetings, we can decide whether or not this is approved and hopefully have a vaccine available as early as next month. As early as next month. Now, th these are for the, the, the littlest ones. And once again, I, we talk about this a lot. How should parents sort of factor whether or not this is a good idea for their kid? You know, when I'm talking to parents, first off, if they have any hesitation, it's really about finding out what that hesitation is. It might be just simply from the concern of what is added into the vaccine, the possibility of a reaction from the vaccine, or in general, maybe just a false belief that needs to be corrected. So I, I try to do that on an individual perspective with parents. But overall, these vaccines, there is no safe, there's no concerns for safety signals in these studies, which is incredibly, incredibly motivating in terms of trying to get these children vaccinated. And also, we've seen in the most recent variant, uh, the, excuse me, the most recent surge in terms of the Omicron surge, our first experience, that those children that were unvaccinated were twice as likely to get hospitalized compared to children who were vaccinated. So it's clear that there is a benefit. And I remind parents at the end that we are in an active surge as cases and hospitalizations are going up. That, that's a great point. Um, and so for the uh, for these children, you say you say we could see vaccine rollout soon with them? Hopefully, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the goal. Uh, after the FDA meetings, we'll fully review all of the data available and then make a formal and final decision. I'm hopeful that the results continue to be this motivating and that we can get this pushed through because there are many parents, as you probably know, that are asking me every day when they can get their children vaccinated. But of course, we wanna do it in the most safe way possible to make sure that we provide a vaccine that's incredibly effective and durable. Absolutely. So let's turn to monkeypox. It's got a scary name. It seems like a scary disease related to smallpox. Uh, in, it is here in little spots here and there in the United States. So for people who are concerned, you know, what are the symptoms of this virus? Uh, what's the seriousness of this disease? How long does it take people to recover? How familiar are, are people are, are, is the medical establishment with monkeypox? So we're very familiar with monkeypox because it is a relative of smallpox. And many may not know outside of medicine the existence of smallpox. Thanks to vaccines, it was declared eradicated in 1980. But monkeypox still remains endemic in certain parts of Central and West Africa. Of course, the concern now is that we're seeing these cases all around the world without an obvious form of transmission, meaning oftentimes monkeypox is transmitted from animal to human and something that we call zoonotic infections, but we don't see any sources of animal infections and we also don't understand where these specific individuals are getting infected from. So that is the question that needs to be answered. Until then, I remind everyone of the symptoms of monkeypox, which includes, it usually starts as a flu-like illness, but then can progress to swollen lymph nodes, headache, and then of course that blistering rash that we've seen circulating around the internet. It's not a time to get fearful, but just remain vigilant and understand what are the signs and symptoms to look for because those who are uh, actively symptomatic are most infectious. So if you think or are concerned that you might have symptoms, contact your doctor or your local Department of Health and isolate yourself. Great point. And then finally, for, for people who are we're still in this pandemic, and for a lot of people, this pandemic was the first time really where they paid attention to public health advisories and the whole public health process. And now they're hearing about monkeypox. Can you just compare a little bit monkeypox with COVID and how people should should address it. The president has said he didn't see a reason to take quarantine measures. He says it is something to be concerned about. But I'm wondering about people who only know public health really through the COVID experience. Mm -hmm. There is a big distinction, isn't there? There is. Monkeypox and COVID-19 are completely different viruses, and they have completely different trajectories about how they move around in the environment. For example, monkeypox is a lot less infectious. It often requires contact, meaning that there has to be close physical contact from one person to another to transmit the virus. And it's relatively difficult to transmit it. If you compare the average reproductive value number of monkeypox compared to COVID-19, and that basically is a number of how many people on average 
one infected will one infected person will get infected. Uh, COVID-19 currently in the setting of the Omicron variant, someone who is infected actively with COVID-19 today on average is likely to infect 12 to 15 other people. But someone who's actively infected with monkeypox today on average is, is likely to infect zero to one people or person. And so that is just a comparison in terms of the level of infectiousness that we're talking about when comparing these two viruses. And then of course, COVID-19 is all around us. It's highly prevalent and monkeypox is rare and remains rare. So I think that they have completely distinct uh, um, uh, personalities per se, if you if you mm. want to think of it that way. And again, it's important to be vigilant and remain aware of this uh, of this possible infection, but I do not believe that it's going to uh, follow in the trajectory of COVID-19. Great. Dr. Darian Sutton, I, I always feel smarter and calmer uh, after we talk, so I thank you very much for that. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.